Okay, let's go to recursive functions then. Recursive functions are a little bit weird because these are functions that call themselves in their own bodies, in their own implementations. And that's a little bit strange, so I'm going to show this first as a programming example, where we take, for instance, the factorial function. We've already seen this. So the factorial of 3, for instance, is 3 times 2 times 1. And mathematically, you can write this as such over here. So you have the factorial of n is 1, if n is 1. And if n is bigger than 1, then you return n times the factorial of n minus 1. And that will return exactly going back into this function until you go from n minus 1, n minus 2, etc. to 1, resulting in the factorial. Now this we can also program. So let's start a function in this case. We could, for instance, use now floating point numbers, just to have something different. Um, and in that case, our, well, our factorial could return a floating point. Um, and we basically just give it as one parameter the number that we need to um, return the factorial of. And as we know, each function returns something, in this case, returns um, it returns the the factorial eventually but it does that in a recursive way and that's the first thing we're going to do we're going to put whatever is here as a definition right for this function so if num equals one then we know let's do it with braces even though it's not really necessary then we return one if, however, it is bigger than 1, we can then return, and then we return the product of uh, num times, and then the factorial of num minus 1. This is exactly the same, the same, the same um, definition, but then as a program. And as I said, the recursive part of this is that fact that you have here a definition of a function and this exact same function in the way it is implemented uses exactly that function again. Now this could lead to loads of problems. If I would have, for instance, put here fact num, then I would uh, repeatedly um, call the fac uh, function, the factorial function, again and again and again and never exit. And this would definitely um, result in something nasty like a core dump but in this case I guarantee that my number gets smaller and smaller so eventually it will, it will return to 1 and therefore it will get multiplied with the previous and uh, that should do it for the factorial implementation so if now in our program I'll put the factorial like this for instance, the factorial is, and then we immediately just say fact number. Um, that should output the factorial, and we'll just add a, an end line to that as well. Right, let's see if this works. So we'll use exactly the same testing function. It compiles the list, and if we just give an integer like 4, then 4 times 6, as we saw earlier, is 24. Or 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 is 24. Good, so that works. Now, the reason it works is because a function can call itself. And also, this is a little bit hard to understand sometimes. But that's what recursive functions are about, and we're going to see this quickly in an example. Right, in this case, the example is, um, uh, is, is uh, also taking care of zero. I haven't done that in my example, but it is actually uh, making more sense for uh, computer scientists to also take into account zero as a possible input. In this case, we haven't done that, but I think this is perfectly okay uh, to do this uh, this way as well. And here we have a possible implementation of our function, which is very close to what I just had. Now, each case we call that function, it gets its own set of local variables that are again destroyed as soon as we exit or we return from that function. 
And this is what we're going to see now in a little animation. So say we have our factorial function over here without a curly bracket, so we can gain a bit of space on the slides. And somewhere else in the main function or some other function, for instance, you basically return a factorial of 4. So we basically uh, get 4 in our results. And we put that into our function over here. Now this invokes again factorial of n minus 1, which in this case is 3. Which in this case does exactly the same. n minus, or 3 minus 1 is 2. Minus 1 is 1. And minus 1 again, because we uh, defined 0 as a possibility, gives us 0. Once the 0 is there, the if test over here will return a 1. And this will then return the next one, uh, which in this case will return n, which was 1 times 1. So 1. After that, um, n times 2, so 2 times 1, returns 2, and so on. The next one will be 3, then 4, until the result 24 is right there where we want it. So this means that every time you recursively call a function, a new instance is created with entirely new variables, and it returns that exactly where you left it. So that's how we, in the end, we can actually define the factorial function quite small and in a very mathematical way, while it still works for a computer. Now more details, uh, things that are possible also for functions is uh, and this is uh, a new uh, part of this uh, function chapter, is that we um, can also define a default value inside a function. So say that a function is called, and it usually is called with one particular number, then you can leave that number away inside the main function, like this for instance over here, or you can supply indeed a parameter, uh, and you can only do this first part if there is a default value. And this default value we just add by saying equals 50, for instance, or you assign um, uh, 50 to that. And this is done inside the definition of the function, as we saw it before. So this is a possibility that you have to your availability. It's called a default value. The next thing I wanted to quickly state is that you can actually have functions that have exactly the same name, but have different functionality depending on the type of variable you work with. So for the factorial, I just chose floats, but what happens uh, for different types? In that case, you can change the functionality of the function by just defining different functions. And those you are then overloading. So you're overloading the name because the name is exactly the same. In this case, for instance, you have the function maximum, which takes two integers and returns an integer. Or you have maximum, which takes two doubles and returns a double. Now, the implementation for those two could be completely different. And that is perfectly OK. You kind of define two completely different functions that have exactly the same name, but where the definition is different in terms of what it returns and what parameters you take for that function. The critical thing here is that the number of parameters should be different and that at least one parameter has to have a different name. In that case, you can just do this. You can just define two functions with exactly the same name and that is called overloading. Later in C++, we'll see very similar things again. Now this is sometimes a little bit problematic if you do this without those two functions belonging together. Because in that case you have two functions with exactly the same name with different functionality. And this sometimes can lead to a lot of confusion. So in that case, this intellectual distance between the two functions that you're defining and implementing should be fairly small. And then finally, we will start slowly to see modules. And modules is where you can define your own functions, put the definition of those functions into a header file. And a header file is designated with the .h at the end of the name of the file. And an implementation file, which is a CPP file, like we saw it, like we defined it, uh, like we use it for defining the main function. Now those two usually have exactly the same name, where the header file is included in the implementation file and the two are then joined together. Where for a particular function, the definition of a function 
is given into the header file and the implementation, so the body of the function between the curly braces, is given in the implementation files. And this way we can create our own little modules, little libraries with functions that we can use or that we can choose to use by including the header file in the next instance. More about that we'll see also later in this course. Then finally, I'll see a, com a little uh, uh, explanation of modules. In this case, uh, this is a module called Calculator, where we make our own namespace. We'll see a little bit later what the namespace is as well, um, where we, in a namespace, define several functions. So here is a function Calculate, for instance, that has two operands that are doubles, and a character that uh, defines the operands and returns a double. Then there is a read operand, a read operator, and the print result function. And those three functions define what a calculator can do, so they are grouped into a namespace called calculator. Now all of that is wrapped into one file called calculator.h. So note that here nothing is being implemented. There are no statements that show what instruction should be called here. It's just a definition of what we have to our availability and what we need to implement later. So in this header file, calculator.h, it's kind of a blueprint of what we need for calculator.cpp. And in there, we include uh, the libraries that we need, like iostream, for instance, for interacting with the user via the terminal, and we include our calculator.h.h header file. Also here, we basically say what we have in our namespace. There we are telling us what we're using in terms of C out, C in an end line, and we then um, define what our functions really mean. There we basically implement our functions. We reiterate what those functions look like and then we tell what those functions should do. In this case there's a couple of if statements and depending on what operator we uh, supply, the multiplication operator or the division operator for instance, it does particular things with the two supplied operands. And by reading, for the reading the operand we have our own function to ask for the input from the user, and to read the operator, we also have something very similar. And that is basically a way of putting into two files a kind of a little library or a module with several functions that belong to this one functionality called calculator. Now, if we want to use this in our main function, we have to use yet another function. For instance, calcmain.cpp. Now this is what we up until now have been using so far. Just one CPP file which has our main function defined and in which the main function does a particular couple of things using functions that were predefined that we use in an included header file. So in this case we say what uh, parts we are using of this particular calculator um, header file and we can use those functions then later in our main function. So in this case this one file that states what we should do or what our executable looks like is just having this one slide or this one screen where we can say pretty clearly what is happening. We have one character, two doubles. We read uh, the operand, we, we read the operator, so the character, and we read the second operand, so the double and then operator and then operand again, and then we print the result by calculating exactly um, using the function that we already defined previously. Now, if that function is absolute and we don't need, ever need to um, change it again, then we can do all the other modifications right here in our main function or in our calc main.cpp file. And that way we can kind of partition off parts of our code that we don't have to touch anymore. Right, if we want to compile this, however, we need to take care of a few other things, because in this case, we need to have those objects that we saw earlier, and we need to link those together. In this case, we have to uh, invoke this by using our compiler G++, but instead of having uh, our the compil compiling straight into an executable, we have to first uh, compile into an object file. Um, so in this case, calcmain.cpp is uh, compiled, but it's not cal compiled into an executable, but it's uh, compiled into an object file, which you can see by the extension.o. That is what this first line here produces. 
The second line does exactly the same for the CPP file that uh, defines and implements all the functions for our calculator. And that presents to us the file calculator.o. And for creating the executable in this case, we do exactly what we did before, except we add our object files uh, as arguments and we specify again what our executable should be called with the minus o flag. So in this case, calc main as an executable is created from the two objects that were created with these two commands before. So this option tells the compiler to skip the linking part and not create an executable, but instead create an object file. And this object file can then later be used over here to see which objects need to be linked together from the calc main uh, to the calculator and back, perhaps. Right, so more about that later when I'm going to see also a little example or another example that goes into that direction as our programming gets a little bit more complicated. And that's it for today.